Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Bible reads, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves." Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world." holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly." Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow." I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. I just pray, Lord, um, that you help me and give me the right words to speak, Lord. I just pray that um, this would be a time where we would learn and grow together. I pray for your blessing on the message, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to preach about tonight is just humility. And we're going to pretty much just stick in Philippians 2, which you probably notice, I mean, really the theme of Philippians 2 is all about humility. And, um, you know, Humility is sort of a basic concept, but it's also something that is so critical to our Christian lives that we just need to regularly be reminded of it and what it is and how do we actually show humility in the Christian life. So the first way that we show humility is we need to have humility towards God. Um, And humility towards God really reveals itself in that we fear God. And you'll often find that, you know, being humble towards God and fearing God go hand in hand. We're in Philippians 2. Look at verses 12 and 13. 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so, you know, just the wording of working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And of course, we know we don't work for salvation. It it would be a really bad application to say that somehow we're working out or earning our salvation. But rather what's being talked about here is, is now that we've been saved, you know, our sanctification, our personal sanctification and growing in holiness, you know, that's done with fear and trembling. And so um, when you think about fearing God, it really has a lot to do with with holding God in reverence. But then when he uses words like trembling, you know, there is an aspect to God in his all powerful nature that we really should literally fear him because he knows all things. He's he's all knowing um, He's, uh, he's all powerful. He's um, omnipresent. So there, there's so many attributes about God where um, we really should fear him. Turn to Job 38. Maybe put a bookmarker in Philippians 2 because we will come back to it. But turn to Job chapter 38. And while you're getting there, let me read for you just a couple of verses about fearing the Lord. Psalm 147, 11, it says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, and those that hope in his mercy. <clears throat> and so God actually takes pleasure in it when, when we actually show a right fear towards him. And it says, in those that hope in his mercy. So we see this connection between fearing God, and, and part of that is hoping in his mercy and him extending mercy to us. Jonah 2 8, it says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So when you actually fear God, um, not only does the Lord take pleasure in that, but, but it's actually a way that God is able to extend mercy unto you simply by the fact that you're holding him in the right regard. When you observe lying vanities, and think about that lying vanities. Lying vanities can be, it can be false religion. It can be anything, really, that distracts you from God. You know, if, if, if the time you should be spending in prayer in your Bible is getting wasted on just you know, trivial things, whatever it is, you know, now you're observing lying vanities. The Bible says you're forsaking your own mercy. And so there's a real connection there between humbly before God, recognizing who he is and God being able to extend mercy to us in all aspects of our life. Um, You know, and part of the problem with that is think about observing lying vanities. Maybe, um, you know, it could be just, Maybe you're really into watching the news or listening to talk radio or you're just into sports or whatever it may be. You know, a lot of those things is fine in moderation depending on the content and what's going on. But when it starts sort of taking the place of things that ought to be, you know, time you should be spending with God, you know, not only are you not taking that time to recognize God, now you're kind of misplacing all of that attention in another direction. And, and so when the Bible talks about the fact that you're forsaking your own mercy, think about it. It's always a, a slippery slope. If your life gets too out of balance to where you're really not having your focus on who God is and what he's done for you, and it's getting off into vanity, um, eventually that slippery slope can continue to the point where now, you know, you start slowly but surely getting into sin. And, and part of fearing God is not living in just this willful, ongoing sin. But a lot of Christians end up doing that, or they, they start there and they stay there. And, and the problem with that is, in the flesh, we all mess up, we all slip, um, we're going to, the flesh is going to battle the spirit as long as we're in this world. But when it gets to the point where you've almost seared your own conscience from the standpoint of, you know, something's not right in your life and you just continue to do it and continue to do it. You know, that's not fearing the Lord. And that's a very dangerous place to be. I would be much more concerned as a Christian 
If you have something in your life that you just, it's not questionable, you just know it's off, you know that it's wrong, you know either you shouldn't be doing it or you should be doing it, depending on what it is. If you just keep doing that, you know, you need to fear the Lord. You need to get right with God. Um, that is a, a very bad place to be. The Lord chasteneth every son whom he loveth. And so if you're just going to kind of blow God off and just perpetually do the same things, um, to me, that's, that's a much scarier place to be than to be in a spot where you slip up or make a mistake. You know, everybody, we, we do that. But, but don't let there be habits in your life where you've just forgotten about fearing the Lord. Are you guys in Job 38? Okay, I'm going to read just part of this chapter. And uh, let's just see, this is God now talking to Job. Job 38, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors, when it brake forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. It goes on like that for three chapters. God's just sort of saying, what do you know? Look at what I've done. Can you even answer these questions? I tell the waves how far to go. You want to tell me the measurements of the universe I make? You know, so God's just sort of, bam, like this is who I am and this is who you are. So let's make sure we're straight on that. And so this whole aspect of humility is, you know, we need to recognize how big and how powerful God is. And that really should be a daily affirmation. Um, you know, hopefully in the morning you're spending time in prayer. And, you know, I, I just personally have found this. When I start my prayer with just a few minutes of just acknowledging how great God is, it really gets your mind, for, you know, set in a place that is good for continuing as you pray, on, pray and other things. But, you know, what? It's, it's not too much to ask to spend a few minutes a day just telling God how amazing he is. I mean, I don't know how many times I've just told God how amazing he is for the very fact that he created everything. You know, and it's like, well, you know, you're just going to say things like that to God over and over again? Well, why not? We're going to spend eternity in heaven. What do you think we're going to be doing? We're going to be worshiping him and thanking him. And I personally think, you know, in heaven... God's going to constantly be teaching us and showing us, but because he's an infinite God, we're going to spend the rest of eternity in awe of God. Because no matter how much we learn about him and how big, there's always going to be something beyond that. So that sense of awe and that sense of fear, that's going to be an eternal emotion, you know, and it's going to be righteous and right. So take the time every day. Humility towards God really does reveal itself towards whether or not you fear God. So make sure you take the time to recognize who God is. Not only does he take pleasure in that, that's going to put you in a spot to where he's going to be able to extend mercy to you. Um, and he wants to extend mercy to us. And um, it's just a critical component of the Christian life. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 2. So the first part of humility is having humility towards God. I would say a second part of humility is having humility about ourselves um, and who we are. And I think that reveals itself through our attitude and, and how we behave ourselves. 
Philippians chapter 2, take a look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. And so Jesus Christ, who is God, <clears throat> made himself of no reputation and he humbled himself. And so you have God in the flesh humbling himself who there's never a reason why God has to humble himself because there's God can't even boast about himself because nothing he says is even boasting. Because there's nothing that could be said about God or by God that is in excess of the glory he's deserving of, if that makes sense. You can't lay it on too thick or um, be too excited about or be um, too complimentary about who God is. And yet Christ came to earth and he humbled himself and was obedient even unto death. And here's what's really critical about that. In verse 8, it says, he humbled himself. There's sort of that saying, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. The easy way is for us to humble ourselves. The hard way is when God says, okay, I have to step in and humble this person. And obviously, we want to be in the first case where we're just humbling ourselves. Matthew 23, 12, it says... And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So when we get out of line and God has to humble us, not only is that a bad experience to go through, but God doesn't really say to us, you know, and after I'm done humbling you, I'll pick you back up. Now, we know he will as, as long as we turn to him and, and, you know, correct ourselves. But, I mean, he'll leave us down in the dirt if he has to, if that's what it takes to finally get us to turn around. But the whole focus here is if we will humble ourselves, if we will abase ourselves, then God himself will pick us up and lift us up. So if you want to be lifted up, if you want to be picked up in this world, where you have to start is by humbling yourself. Look at verses 14 through 16 in in Philippians 2, right where we're at. It says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So doing all things without murmurings and disputings, you know, in the same way that being humble towards God reveals itself by the very fact that we fear God. And when you don't fear God, and, you know, especially when you're living in ongoing sin, you know, that's a sign you're not humble enough towards God. So I think this thing right here that says, do all things without murmurings and disputings, this verse... That's a good sign of if you're doing a lot of murmuring and a lot of disputing, you probably don't have a humble attitude about yourself because that's the sign of a person that's really got themselves lifted up and is puffed up. Um, Complaining is just a really uh, bad attribute to have as a Christian. That is not a good way to shine forth as a light for Jesus Christ. And and there's so many ways that we do that in our daily lives. You know, I drive for a living. And one of the things is I get really frustrated with people being in my way. I want them out of my way. You know, road rage is so typical. And, and really what that is, is it's just a sign of the fact that you think you're more important than other people. I mean, no matter how you slice it, it really is like, why are you in my way? Why did you do that? You know, somebody cutting you off. In traffic, you know, in your in your mind, you could be cursing them or in your mind, you could be blessing them. 
And really the difference is humility. I mean, does it really matter? But we get into this default emotion of I'm important, right? And we don't even say it to ourselves that way. But if you really examine, I mean, sometimes when I get out on my job and I'm having a frustrating day, it's like, you know, the main reason I'm frustrated is because my own attitude about myself is too lifted up. You know, I'm not always a great driver myself. So why am I getting so frustrated with these other people that probably aren't guilty of anything more than something I've done at some time? So, so we, we get too lifted up and it, it causes us to be impatient with people. It causes us, um, you know, just really to, to think of ourselves as better than other people. So our attitude is really a reflection of, of how much do we really just like Christ, we're humbling ourselves, we're treating ourselves as a servant. It's the difference between, you know, how could they do that? And that's okay, not a problem. Let it go, you know. And, and that really should be the way that we handle a lot of things. We're not here to be walked all over, but a lot of times when we get impatient and frustrated with other people in this life, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that they're walking all over us. It's just the fact that we think we're more important than they are. So a lot of frustration would be relieved if we would just humble ourselves and get our attitude in check. Third part of humility is having humility towards others. And I think humility towards others, in the same way that humility about ourselves reveals itself in our attitude, Humility towards others kind of reveals itself through our work ethic. And what I mean by that is once we're saved, we have a purpose here. And our purpose here is to share the gospel with other people. Um, We don't want people to go to hell, obviously. We want them to have the same free salvation that we've taken. And so... We have work to do here. This is a working church. You know, we get together and we have fellowship and we have good times together, but we're not here just to be a social club. We're here to get something done for the kingdom of God. And the primary way we do that is by sharing the gospel with others. We're in Philippians 2. Um, Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so there's this exhortation that, you know, we need to be thinking about what's going on with other people um, more so than we're thinking about what's going on with us. And look, even in your prayer life, My default setting in prayer is usually I'm praying about my stuff first, right? And, and maybe you're not like that, but I'll, I'll tell you this. It's, it'll do a lot for you in your prayer life. If you really start, because prayer can be work too, if you're serious about it and if you're doing a lot of it. Um, and so a big part of that is in your prayer life, is that punctuated by spending a lot more time praying for others than praying for yourself, you know, and bring your personal request to God. He wants to hear it. Obviously, you don't need to shy away from that. But are you really putting the time in in your prayer life to pray for others? Look at verse 19. Because there's actually two examples here in Philippians 2 about two really good examples of people who are humble towards others and it shows itself as being a high work ethic. So verse 19 He's talking about Timotheus and he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state for I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. And so Paul here is really, I mean, Timotheus is getting a very high compliment from Paul. And and he says, for I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state for all seek their own, not the things 
which are Jesus Christ. So he's saying, you know, all of you naturally are kind of looking after yourselves, but Timotheus, his natural state is he's worrying about you guys first. That's, I mean, that's a big compliment. That would be a great thing for somebody to say about. You say, this person is always looking out for everybody else. You know, and, and now if you want to get into a right application of James 2, faith without works is dead. All right, now we could bring James 2 into it and be like, okay, you know, this is because obviously Timotheus is showing this great example and his faith is apparent to a lot of people. Why? Because he's doing the work and he's working for other people. Take a look at verse 25. Now here's Epaphroditus, 25 through 30. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. So there's a lot going on here. And Epaphroditus, this guy's a workhorse. Um, Look at verse 27. It says, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. So again, because of the humility of Epaphroditus, this was a man clearly who feared God. Remember, that fear of God translates into God also having mercy on you. So in, in that humility that he showed, you know, God healed him from being sick. And it says here, Verse 29, hold such in reputation. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. So literally, this man's working so hard, he's working himself close to death for the cause of Christ. That's that's remarkable. And Paul finishes it off saying, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. I don't think Paul was necessarily beating up on the Philippians here, but he was kind of saying, look, you guys weren't getting everything done, but these guys, Timotheus and Epaphroditus, they were getting it done. And um, they were taking care of things that you guys weren't necessarily taking care of. So what you see is when you have humility towards others and you really do esteem others as more important than yourselves, then really, you know, your setting is that of you're just worried about what do I get done for you? You know, and that is such a great attitude in church. We want to come here. It's like, how can we be a blessing to other people? And, you know, that's what I really want to see in this church. I have no concerns about this church growing. I have no concerns about the fact that God is going to bless it. But, you know, we could have just the greatest doctrine ever, but if the spirit gets amiss, if we if we lose humility, then things can get off the tracks real fast, right? You have big churches out there where the spirit is just not what it ought to be. And and luckily in this church, you know, we have a lot of brothers and sisters where I honestly believe everybody has a humble heart and it's like, that's where we want to keep it. So it's easy to preach sermons like this because this isn't an issue that we have at this church, but we want to, we want to stay on the right track, be humble, want to serve other people. The number one way we do that is soul winning and soul winning. You know, obviously we're commanded to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Um, But, you know, the thing about soul winning is it's one of the best ways to show that you care about other people. But it's not really this end all be all to humility. Um, There are soul winners out there that are still obnoxious. So you can go out and do the act and you can still not have a humble attitude towards other people. I've seen it. Um, I'm sure I've been guilty of it at times. So it's not enough just that you're doing the work. There has to be genuine care for the people you're out there trying to reach. You know, Um, when you're dealing with that person at the door, 
that's the one soul you need to be focused on because that's the soul you're dealing with. And if you can't focus entirely on that soul, you need to, you know, whether it be through prayer or take a breather for a minute or whatever, but get focused on the fact that you need to be focused on that person. Um, You know, and I've seen attitudes sometimes, especially in social media and stuff, people will get into doctrinal arguments and one person will say something to the effect of, well, do you even go soul winning? Almost like it's a trump card on, you know, the, this proves I'm twice as humble as you are. And it's like, are you listening to yourself? That is not the right attitude whatsoever. Um, we all should be soul winning. But soul winning, it, it should never turn into this thing where it's like, well, I've proven that I love people because I go soul winning. So when I'm not soul winning, I'm kind of more free to be obnoxious. That's, that's not what it should be getting into. Um, it's not just, you know, the fact that we go soul winning. It also has to be how do we do it. Turn to Luke chapter 6. This is the last place I'm going to have you turn to tonight. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 6 real fast. Very famous passage. Starting in verse 27. Luke six twenty-seven. It says, but I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. And so, you know, this is an ongoing theme we see in the Word of God about understanding, you know, we need to love people. We need to pray for them, which despitefully uses. How are you going to do that without humility? It's impossible. I mean, it's the exact opposite of that sort of road rage attitude. It's you have to put people above yourselves to even have the first shot at being able to do that. And if you don't feel that way, well, that's normal. That's because we're in this flesh. That's why we have to pray to God to help us to feel the way we need to feel, right? God is able to supply us with that spirit. We already have the Holy Spirit within us. So now it's just a matter of we have to rely on God to really allow us. You know, we need to be nice to people that aren't nice to us. You know, this is basic, but this is such a huge part of what we do. So... You know, and and that's really a big part of it as well. We get into church and and we kind of hang out with the same people and we have the same friends and and it's only natural that we're going to hang out with other saved people and so forth. But, you know, honestly, being nice to one another, especially in this type of, that's easy, you know, but a real sign of humility is can you extend that same level of grace to people that maybe don't even like you? Right. Or don't see eye to eye with you. So, you know, the real test, I I heard a good thing the other day, you know, being content, being content is easy when everything is taken care of. The true test of whether you're a content individual or not is when you don't have everything you used to have. Maybe you're in a valley in life or you're struggling a little bit. If you can be content at that time, that's a better test. So a better test of your humility and putting others above yourself. Yes, how we treat one another in the church, that's important. But how are you treating people outside of the church? You know, and, and the other thing that is important, too, is here in Luke 6, it says here, 
Look at verse... Thirty, thirty-two. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend. Listen to this, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And so, you know, one thing that I think gets the ball rolling as far as really having a humble attitude is when we're reflecting on how great God is, let's also reflect on the fact because he's all knowing and he's all present and he sees everything, nothing you do for the glory of God is going to pass by him. All right, so there's no such thing as doing a good work for God and not getting credit in a sense for it. But what we need to be worried about is not getting the credit of men, but just God seeing that we're doing things for the right reasons. And so there's a balance there. You know, we want people to see our good works to the extent that we want to exhort and encourage other people. So we're not going to play undercover brother our whole lives. We're trying to do everything in secret and nobody knows anything good that we're doing. You know, there is a, we don't want to hide our light under a bushel. So that's not the point. But at the same time, every good thing you do for Christ shouldn't always come in the form of a church activity. Right. We should be living lives where there's just things we do simply because we know it pleases God. Right. There can be soul winning that happens outside of our soul winning times. You know, there's all sorts of good works you can be doing for other people. I think a lot about when he says go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in and bring in the halt and the maimed and the blind. Right. Bring in all the people that can't pay you back. Because I'm going to reward you, you know, and really we need that should be exciting because it doesn't matter if you're a pastor of a church or a deacon or anything like every person who's saved has the potential to go out there and work as hard as they want to for the glory of God, knowing that God's going to recognize it and reward you in heaven. I mean, everyone really is from that standpoint on sort of an equal playing field of we all have the same opportunities out there, you know, both in the church and out side of the church to go out there and do things where God's like, man, this guy is a faithful worker. You know, this, this lady is, is getting so much done for the glory of God. That's exciting, but we have to view it as an opportunity and not just as an obligation or something we have to go through. So, um, so, you know, being humble towards others, it, it really is about doing the work. It shows itself through the work ethic, but it also shows, you know, through and the fact that we do it simply because it pleases God and we know that he'll reward it. So I guess to wrap up, you know, as far as humility goes, do you fear God? You know, because that's going to show if you're humble towards him. Do you have a right attitude and do you work hard for others? You know, and those are things that we all should be evaluating in our own lives and pressing forward. And where you see weakness in your own life, Pray to God about it and, you know, be thankful that if you're humbling yourself before God, he's going to be merciful to you. He he gives us each time to develop. So let's just all continue to grow and let this church be a church of compassion and of humility. And we're going to get a lot done for God that way. So and um, our light will shine forth to this community and will be a good example to those around us. And at the same time, we'll do things that they don't see just because it's a part of who we are. And that's going to please God. So praise God. And um, let's just stay humble and, and keep doing the work. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, um, that you humbled yourself and were obedient even to the death, Lord. Thank you for giving us a perfect example of that. And I just pray, Lord, that um, you just press into us the need to just esteem others greater than ourselves. And I pray, Lord, to help us to just focus in our prayer life um, on just recognizing how great you are. Um, and how mighty you are, Lord. And, and I just pray that we would all individually humble ourselves 
um, so that you don't have to humble us, but rather you could be pleased with the fact that we fear you um, and that we strive to serve others. Lord, we thank you so much for this church. Please bring back Pastor and his family and the Tiberics back safely to us. Lord, we thank you for all the ways you bless us. Um, We just ask you to take everyone home safely. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.